reading the book The Wow Factor by Michael Ivingood. Chapter number 12. Can you grow a church and have revival? Is it possible to pastor a church in revival and see the church grow numerically at the same time? I think pastors ask me this question more than any other. The author of a recent book who serves as an executive officer within his denomination and has a portfolio, including credentialing of ministers, responds to the same question. During the process of credentialing, he asked a question or about their views of the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit. The question seems to produce discomfort. These young Pentecostal leaders often admit they struggle over how to answer. They want to see the Holy Spirit move, but they do not want to pastor a church that is irrelevant. For the years I spent in pastoral ministry, my library is full of books on church growth. Both churches I pastored experienced a significant numerical increase in a season of no growth for most others. During my early years of itinerant ministry, I sought to observe what caused churches to grow, always anticipating that someday I might be the senior leader of a church again. While that has not been the plan of God for my life, I remain interested in the things that cause the kingdom of God to grow. By this point, you realize that I am uncompromisingly a revivalist, a river person, outpouring oriented. At the same time, I recognize many believe a church cannot be large and growing while being Pentecostal in style and beliefs. I simply disagree with them. I do so on the basis that the largest churches in the world are usually Pentecostal or charismatic in theology and practice. I do acknowledge the largest ones in the United States are usually considered evangelical. And even those that are Pentecostal in doctrine are often not Pentecostal in practice. Another reason I disagree is based on personal experience. I have watched the Pentecostal church world for many years, and I do recognize many of those churches are shrinking. However, I currently work with three revival churches that are experiencing or have experienced significant growth numerically. Actually, the number is larger. Only two days before writing this, before this writing, I spoke with my mother, who has served as an interim at a church for the last two years. In that season, the church has nearly doubled in attendance. The material I present in this chapter will not be exhaustive nor complete because that would take a book on church growth itself. But I want to observe a few things these growing revival churches seem to have in common. First, they are committed to growing the kingdom of God and they are not ashamed to desire a numerical increase. This is not a desire for numbers for the sake of numbers alone but a recognition that numbers represent people and they are committed to populating heaven. The mission statement of one of those churches includes a line about becoming a large congregation. Outreach is important to them. From raw evangelistic events to more subtle pre-evangelism activities that serve their communities they are consistently turned their attention outward. Secondly, these churches are led by visionary, some would say apostolic leaders. These are strong leaders, but they're not dictatorial nor tyrannical. I understand there are different models of church life, 
some feel very strongly about a plurality of elders, of leaders. They are an elder-driven model. Some churches feel very strongly about being democratic. They are congregational-driven. Some churches feel strongly about being an extension of a denomination or stream. Their approach toward ministry and church life is determined by patterns within that denomination. Please, do not hear this last statement as a condemnation of denominations. I am credentialed with the world's largest Pentecostal denomination. My personal experience, though, is that rarely do the models I have mentioned experience ongoing significant growth. Where large churches practice the above, uh, where large churches practicing the above leadership models do exist, I would suggest the following. Their growth probably came during an earlier period of church life under a strong apostolic type of leader. Or the growth probably came during a time in society when church involvement was more the norm. I'm just not aware of any significant church growth that takes place apart from a strong apostolic type of leader. The style of the church may run from seeker to purpose-driven to traditional to revival. But growing churches are led by strong leaders. Surveys support my personal experience. The senior pastor plays a key role in growing churches. There is a temptation on the part of river or revival type churches to discount the role of leadership. One pastor said to me, if my stream does one more conference on leadership, I will cram it down their throat. Let me be clear on this. I do not believe leadership can replace the presence and the anointing. But without leadership, revival itself will not produce strong, growing churches. Revival reveals what already exists. Revival will reveal any cracks in the leadership. It will expose any shaky foundations. Revival itself does not make leadership strong. If you were a poor leader before the revival, the revival itself would not make you a good leader. Therefore, I would suggest the leader who is pursuing the presence of God and revival needs to also develop his or her leadership skills. The strong revival leader is surrounded by leaders of similar spirit and vision. Moses had an errand. As a pastor, I was highly motivated by a story from one of the great churches of my denomination. About half of the pastoral staff, including the senior pastor, and about half of the board of deacons, were killed in a tragic plane accident. They were returning from a mission trip when their small plane went down. As the state superintendent of my denomination met with the surviving board members, they asked if he would help them find a new pastor. He assured them he would. Then they shared the strangest statement he had heard from a church board. When you find a pastor, please tell them we are yes men. He asked them to explain this statement. He had never had a church board tell him they were yes men. They said, we were a very average church for many years until we came to understand that God could speak to our pastor. We are not threatened by that. Our job is to help him carry out the vision God has given him. That spirit caused the church to become one of the largest churches in the state. Everything we saw happen in our last pastorate came because the leadership of the church, the deacon board, believed in and adopted 
my vision. We did not spend time squabbling over direction. Rather, time was spent developing that direction. The spirit of this is seen in Joshua chapter 1, verse 16. So they answered Joshua, saying, All that you command us, we will do. Wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so will we heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and a good courage, New King James. In my imagination, I can see the note sent from the elders and deacons being handed to a pastor by an usher. Dear pastor, please be aware that Sister Snuffleupticus was complaining and murmuring against you and the direction of the church. Do not fear. We took her outside and stoned her to death. Be strong and lead us on. Okay, I'm not encouraging the stoning to death of dissenters. But making the point that strong churches have strong leaders who surround the leader. They encourage him or her to be everything God has called them to be. They help bring to pass the vision God has for that church. These leaders can make or break revival. Several years ago, I was preaching a revival in a northern state of the USA. These were good people, albeit a bit conservative by background. Things were definitely happening outside of their box. I went to pray for a lady one night and was strongly checked by the Holy Spirit. I was to pray, but I was not to touch her. My hand was only a few inches away from her head, so she likely knew I was there, but it did not touch her. Her husband stood next to her watching me as I prayed and as she fell to the floor under the power of God. I did not feel I was to pray for him, so I did not. The next night, she was at the altar, and once again he was standing next to her with eyes open. I did not touch her. From a distance of at least four or five feet, I pointed at her. I am sure she did not know I was there. Once again, she hit the floor. The third night, I was probably 15 feet away from her. Again, her eyes were closed. Again, he was watching me. I felt just a wave in her direction. Again, she fell to the floor. He walked up to me and said, pray for me. I did. Nothing appeared to happen. Sunday morning, this same man was leading the worship. He acknowledged things happening in the revival that he did not understand and that many questions existed in the minds of the people. However, the combination of the change in his wife's life and the fact he knew I had not pushed her convinced him God was in it. He told the people, I do not understand it all, but I want to be a bridge to help you across. I know God is in this. The pastor turned to me and said, that statement is huge. You will never realize how huge it is. As this leader embraced what God was doing, it encouraged others to take the same step. Leaders need leaders to stand with them. The fourth principle revival churches experiencing church growth follow is that they recognize roadblocks and are willing to deal with them. They live as did the men of Issachar who according to 1 Chronicles 12 and 32 understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Revival leaders need to understand the times. They must understand the culture they live in and even more hear from God as to what they should do. 
There are keys to every situation. Not every key fits every lock, but every lock has a specific key. Church growth and church growth revival leaders find the key that unlocks their city in God. My father drilled this little cliche into me. We are anchored to the rock and geared to the times. We must understand those things that are immovable and those things that should be moved. There is a difference between fads and principles. Fads will always change. Principles never will. Fads are often short-lived vehicles used to carry out a principle. A ministry built on fads will not endure. A perfect illustration of this is the church cafe. 15 to 20 years ago, very few churches had cafes. In fact, some denominations would have preached against it. Today, most churches I minister in have some type of cafe or coffee bar. It may consist of a few tables in the lobby, or it may be a full-blown cafe with a kitchen that rivals any commercial enterprise. But many have some area designated for this purpose. For some, the church cafe was a fad. Churches joined in the trend toward the cafe because everyone else was doing it and they did not want to appear out of touch. For some, the cafe posed problems. They thought it would produce quick growth. It didn't. Others saw the cafe as a means to developing relationships or fellowship in the church and as an opportunity for leadership to connect with people. A lot of pastoral work can be accomplished in a relatively short period in the cafe after service. Often the cafe has faltered for the first two examples but succeeded well with the third. I know of at least one church that has used proceeds from a cafe to fund much of the missions outreach from the church. The principle was fellowship or pastoral connection. The method employed was a church cafe. The rock is fellowship. The timely gear is the cafe. Growing churches recognize roadblocks to church growth and are not afraid to sacrifice sacred cows. Some methods that were awesome 50 years ago are counterproductive today. The constant challenge is to recognize the difference between fad and principle. In the early days of revival, the Lord spoke to me about learning to live by principles. Worship is a principle. Singing is the biblical way to carry out this mandate. However, the style of song is more a matter of taste and culture. Again, I acknowledge I am unapologetically a revival junkie. I have friends who have spent much time attacking the seeker-friendly type of church. I have been guilty of doing the same. I must admit, I. I do have issues with anyone compromising core biblical doctrines and practices. Salvation by the blood of Jesus is non-negotiable. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is the same for me. Healing was not intended to be divisive, but to be a blessing. I will not compromise these things. However, there are many things I can learn from the seeker style of church. For example, does my language make sense to the unchurched? Or do only the initiated understand me? This message was brought home to me while giving a salvation invitation several years ago. I was inviting people who wanted to give their lives to Jesus to come to the altar. Standing in the balcony, was a young man 
who had never been to a revival service before. His religious background was Catholic. The message had made sense and he wanted to respond to it. However, the word altar was throwing him off. He could see nothing at the front of that Assemblies of God church that looked like the altar of his church. Fortunately, the school teacher standing next to him recognized his dilemma and brought him to the front of the building. Later that night, she shared with me what had happened. I made a significant change. From that night, I invite those who are asking Jesus into their lives to leave your seat, make your way to the nearest aisle, walk to the front of this building, stand in this open space here at the front, and face me. Everybody understands that direction. Later, I may explain why we call the front of this building the altar. Once I had them standing at the front, I bring up the prayer team. I lead them in a sinner's prayer and have the prayer team, altar counselors, also pray and counsel them. Does my church make the visitor feel welcome? What is their experience like from the time they enter the parking lot to contact with people after the meeting? As a pastor, I was aware people go to church to meet God and to make a friend, but not necessarily in that order. I could pretty much guarantee they would meet God because I would pray that through. However, I needed help if the visitors were going to meet and make a friend. Revival does not change those realities. I once pastored the oldest, most historic Pentecostal church in a community of 10,000. I think there were five other Pentecostal churches in my community. At least four of them traced their roots to my church. I was told at least three of the evangelical churches did the same. We probably had the best facilities. I thought we had the best preaching. Okay. I am a little biased on that. Our music team was better than others. However, the reality was that at least two of those churches were growing faster than mine. The church nursery is just as important to most people as the platform performance of your pastor. The presence of the Lord God has found your church. But can the people find it? Are directions to the church restroom clear? Or does the visitor need a seeing eye dog to find it? The greeters are among the most important people you have. They are the front line. Being an itinerant preacher can be an interesting experience. For many years, we traveled by RV. Usually, it was placed behind the church in the car park. In those days, I often went into the church building early to pray, leaving my wife to enter the building on her own later. Since she was unknown by the greeter at the door, her experience more typically represented what the average visitor could expect. On far too many occasions, her experience was the kind that discouraged people. Often people make up their minds about the church before the first song is sung. Here is a personal gripe. I hate a service that takes up 20 minutes of time for everyone to greet everyone else. I dislike that for two reasons. First, I must keep extending myself. I have to stretch my comfort zones. If I, as a professional, struggle with 20 minutes of talking to people I don't know. What is going through the heart of someone who's never been to church before or someone who is a bit shy? My second gripe is very personal. As a guest speaker, I normally have a very limited time frame to preach on a Sunday morning and those 20 minutes 
are like gold to me. Principle number five relates to prayer. In the growing revival church, prayer is given more than lip service. You can grow large numbers through your program, activities, and promotion. Apparently, you can even do that without prayer. However, most, if not all, of the dynamically alive and growing congregations I am connected with recognize the importance of prayer. First, the leaders themselves pray. Secondly, they find creative ways to keep the people engaged in prayer. Principle number six has to do with the purpose of the church. In a growing revival church, the DNA, or the purpose of the church, is clearly understood. In years gone by, some have called this the mission statement. I attempted to make this something very clearly understood by the church I pastored. For those years, we operated on the wife's principle. Worship, instruction, fellowship, evangelism, service. Today, I would say we exist to make disciples. And we will do that through worship, instruction, fellowship, evangelism, and service. All the above can and should take place within the context of revival. I will argue that the revival described in the book of Acts was to be the normal pattern of church life and church growth. Methods will change, but those five principles do not. They are biblical. The final principle is perhaps the heart of the issue. How do you make the unchurched comfortable with a revival, river, outpouring atmosphere? Some think you must downplay the activity of the Holy Spirit, as if to suggest He does not understand the human nature. As I listen to some, I begin to pick up the sense that they feel a need to protect their people from the Holy Spirit. First of all, may I suggest your people do not need to be protected from Him? Secondly, they are His people, not yours. The spin-off of this philosophy suggests we need to place, I started to say hide, all Holy Spirit activities in another room or another service. Let me suggest two alternatives. Celebrate it. If you are comfortable and natural with the work of the Holy Spirit, others will be comfortable too. Many unchurched people do not know what is proper decorum in church anyway. My experience suggests it is usually the religious, not the unchurched, who are uncomfortable with the activity of the Holy Spirit. More importantly, explain it. It is okay to take time to explain what the Holy Spirit is doing. You can do this privately to your guest. If you suspect they may see something in your church they are unfamiliar with, why not make a preemptive strike? Share in advance what they can expect. If that is not workable, you can take time after a service to chat with your friends. Ask them what was different about your church in light of their previous experiences. Then be prepared to give them a biblical explanation for what took place. It is all right to admit you do not know an answer, but will find it. As a pastor, you can do this publicly from the pulpit. When I was in pastoral ministry, I often explained the vocal gifts of the Holy Spirit, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, after they occurred. I would say something to the effect, the revival teaches that, or the Bible teaches that God not only speaks to us through His Word, 
but he will also speak to us through what the Bible calls gifts from his spirit. I would explain that what just happened can be found in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 14. In the space of two or three minutes or less, I could explain what just happened. Not only did I give the people an understanding of a biblical experience, but it also created a sense of safety. I've done this in reference to manifestations as well. One career missionary observed the strength of the revival service he attended was the three to five minute spot where the pastor or I explained things like people falling down during the service. He felt safe. Let me close this chapter by suggesting you cannot lead where you have not been yourself. You want a church that is both experiencing strong numerical increase and a strong flow of the Spirit revival. It can happen. There is no need to sacrifice one to get the other. Yes, leadership will be required. Perhaps that is why God put you there. And that brings chapter number 12 of the book, The Wow Factor, to a close. We have one more chapter that we will look forward to sharing with you.